presenter, uh, Dr. McDonald from Dundee. He will present the standard care versus selecoxib outcome trial. Uh, a randomized trial comparing the cardiovascular safety of selecoxib versus traditional non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Thank you, Chairman, uh, um, and thank you for inviting me to give this presentation. Uh, this has been a major undertaking by academics in Europe to try and uh, look at the safety of uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, the conflicts of interest are that there, our university actually run this trial, and it was all run by academics. Although Pfizer did provide the funding, they had no real control over the trial. So. This is the background to this. You remember the, the brouhaha about uh, rofecoxib and other coxibs causing cardiovascular disease. Um, and both coxibs and uh, non-selective, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as diclofenic, ibuprofen, have been associated with uh, cardiovascular adverse events. So Scott compared the cardiovascular safety of celecoxib with non steroidal uh, therapy in the setting of the European healthcare and that means patients who were free from cardiovascular disease. So Scott was initially a European Medicines Agency commitment. So we uh, took patients who were 60 or over with uh, arthritis, either osteo or rheumatoid, who didn't have any record of having a stroke, a heart attack, or, um, or other significant cardiovascular disease, and they were already taking chronic prescribed NSAIDs for their condition. And we did quite an interesting study. It was a pragmatic trial in that we went to general practices and searched all the records, found all those who were suitable, invited all suitable subjects, randomized those who met the eligibility criteria. The, the treatments were actually prescribed by the GPs in the normal way. And we tried to mimic normal care as much as possible in that thereafter there were no formal visits and the patients were just treated by the GPs in the normal way. But we followed up by the powerful method of record linkage to hospitalization and deaths. So we were able to get all the hospitalization records and death records. So the endpoints for this study were primarily cardiovascular, which is non-fatal heart attack hospitalization, non-fatal stroke hospitalization, or cardiovascular death. We did also include biomarker positive acute coronary syndrome, but there were almost none of those. And the secondary endpoint was upper gastrointestinal ulcer complications, which is why the coxibs were initially developed, if you remember. And then there was a series of other secondary outcomes that we looked at. So this uh, study was powered for non-inferiority to exclude a 40% increase in cardiovascular events, which required 277 events on treatment. So we adjudicated these endpoints by getting, first of all, a record of hospitalization or death, and then getting the original hospital case records or the death certificate or, or even post-mortem certificates. And we retrieved these and abstracted them and they went to independent uh, data, uh, sorry, endpoint committees. And these are the endpoint committees and John McMurray chaired the cardiovascular endpoint committee, James Scheiman from Michigan, uh, the gastrointestinal endpoint committee, and we had an independent data monitoring committee chaired by Kim Fox from London. So we screened 9,400 people. Uh, we randomized 7,297. The mean follow-up was actually very long, 3.2 years, and some patients were up to 6.3 years followed up. There were nine regional centers throughout Denmark, UK, and the Netherlands, and in total, 706 primary care practices participated. The baseline characteristics are here. The, the thing to say about these patients is they're all elderly, 68 main, uh, mean age at entry and 71 or more at exit. They all had the panoply of cardiovascular risk factors that one encounters in normal care, uh, high cholesterol, uh, you know, high, high blood pressure. They're all taking you know, aspirin or, um, or other things that you would normally encounter. And any cardiologist would think that these people are probably at reasonably high risk of a cardiovascular event. We stratified the randomization according to the baseline NSAID, so almost 40% were taking diclofenac, which at that time was the major drug in Europe, and 30% were taking ibuprofen. So the adjudicated event rate, we would expect to be about 2 or 3% in this study, but in fact it was 0.9%, 0.9%, as a 10-year event rate of 9%. 
And then the intention to treat adjudic uh, adjudicated event rate was 1.1. This is very low event rates. And then there were only 12, only 12 ulcer-related upper GI complications in the whole study. And in the intention to treat only 15. And we were as astonished as anyone else. We're absolutely certain we didn't miss any endpoints in this study. So this is a reflection of what is happening out there in the real world. So this is the primary composite endpoint. Here is um, the graph as it should be drawn with a, a hundred on the um, vertical axis. And here's the inset with it expanded. You see there's not any significant difference in the Kaplan-Meier estimates here of um, cardiovascular endpoints. And for the intention to treat, it's again, not even a blip of a signal. In fact, we, this is non-inferior, Celecox is non-inferior to NSAID. This is all-cause mortality, which again is not different. And this is the intention to treat all-cause mortality. Absolutely, lines could overlap each other. We did a stratified analysis by baseline NSAID, ibuprofen here on treatment or intention to treat, diclofenac on other NSAIDs. There's no heterogeneity here. There's a slight wobble in the point estimate, but no heterogeneity. So the one interesting thing was that in a pragmatic trial, you don't really control what people are getting all the time. And about 50% of people throughout the entire trial withdrew from celecoxib, which was more than those that withdrew from NSAIDs. Um, and I guess anyone who's been on a long-term NSAID may well prefer their old NSAID to their new NSAID. So that is something that you might expect might happen. However, this is the reasons for withdrawal. And 11% said that they withdrew because of lack of efficacy to sell a coxib. Um, and bearing in mind they were all on their previous NSAID. So those who stayed on their previous NSAID might well have a lower withdrawal rate. People in this study got their hip fixed, so they stopped taking NSAIDs, um, and that's why some stopped. Some stopped because of adverse event, doctor recommendation, patient request, not tolerated, some for, because of an adverse event. Hardly anybody because of a protocol violation. So the safety outcomes from this study are important. Um, serious events are those events that happen that nobody has attributed to the drugs. So there's the same in each group, the serious events. And these, these are anything that requires a hospitalization that happens to people throughout the study. Serious adverse reactions are those things that people thought were related to the drug treatment. And these were not different between the study groups. Interestingly, a subgroup of the serious adverse reaction showed there was fewer um, gastrointestinal adverse reactions with celecoxib, as one might uh, imagine might be the case. And finally, adverse reactions. We didn't capture adverse events in this study, but adverse reactions were more common uh, with celecoxib in this study. So in summary, patients with arthritis and without known cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular event rates were low, in fact very low, and serious ulcer-related complications were <laughs> almost vanishingly low. Neither outcome differed significantly between NSAIDs and celecoxib. Now I used to be a regulator, I'm okay now, and in the study population, um, celecoxib in my view appeared safe, as well as NSAIDs appeared safe. And in patients who get significant symptomatic relief, that is, they get benefit, I, my view is that these medicines, the benefit-risk balance appears positive. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. McDonald. Now uh, is open to discussion. Are there any questions, comments? I do have to sneak out afterwards to chair a meeting at half past, so this is your only opportunity, I'm afraid. I, I would like to remind you that uh, uh, after, at the end, uh, the, the ESC spokesperson for this uh, hotline session is uh, Dr. Lars Rieden from Stockholm, and he is here in the room, available to uh, answer further questions you may have. Um, yes, I, I just want to, perhaps you said this, but I, I missed it. Could you clarify whether... Um, the, uh, the rates uh, are uh, referred to exposure to the drug, or are you following the patients? They, apparently they went on and off. Some patients got the surgery and didn't have a need for it anymore. So are these rates uh, during exposure to the drug? I'll give you two rates. One was the on-treatment rate, where people were exposed, the 0.9. Another okay. was the intention to treat. And in a pragmatic trial, you could argue which one should be the, the primary. We technically chose the on-treatment rate. Yeah. So it's 0.9 events. So that is a really low rate. I mean, 
you wouldn't predict that. You, you could argue that, well, are these NSAIDs protective? <laughs> because you expect 2.5%. And, and it's, it's one of the issues with, with any trial, that you recruit people who tend to be lower risk than the population. So that's one of the issues with all trials, I think. And um, I, I think we've, there's also a reduction in rates being seen throughout the world, yeah. especially in westernized countries. We've had something like a 40% reduction in cardiovascular event rates over the last 10 did years. You, did you do a subgroup analysis about whether there were certain uh, subgroups who, who may have had higher, especially higher or lower risk? We did lots of subgroup analysis. Nothing very, nothing interesting came out of any of them, unfortunately, nothing significant. And, um, the, you know, I couldn't present all the data because I've got eight minutes, but there's nothing much in any subgroup. We looked at heart failure, renal failure. And there's only a few events in some of these subgroup analysis. So, so no particular risk factor for cardiovascular disease popped out as, as being... No, I'm afraid not. Okay. Wish there was. A rheumatoid was the same as osteo. Was Wish it was. <laughs> it would have been more interesting if there had been. Yeah. Had something to report. <laughs> we have a question over Thank here, you. and then uh, on the on the back side here, just. Yeah, Lars Ridian, one of the spokespersons. I think, uh, alluding to what you said just recently, one important question here is how did you rule out coronary artery or other atherosclerotic disease in this population? Because we have in particular been afraid of using these types of drugs in people with established uh, atherosclerotic disease. And you said you picked up people who did not, but they are in an age group where many of them actually may have, although they don't know. So we had um, the GP records to search, so anybody who was on nitrates and things were not, were not included in the search. We also had their previous hospitalizations, so nobody with a previous hospitalization for a coronary disease or TIA was included. So it, right at the beginning of the initial search, we only tried to find people who were free from cardiovascular disease, and then when they were interviewed by the nurse, who then went through the exclusion criteria and excluded people who might have significant cardiovascular disease. So I think we were pretty clean at that. As good as you can without doing a coronary angiogram on everyone, which of course was in a pragmatic trial, not what you do. Over there, yes. Hi, um, given that you were originally powered to eliminate a possible 40% excess risk, and given the low event rate, um, what is, with your results, would, would be the most that you could say it, uh, celecoxib uh, would not have an excess risk of? A, a good point. I mean, let me just give you the background to this. This was originally a European Medicines Agency uh, trial. Um, Pfizer, early on, uh, tried, well, they complained to the European Medicines Agency that this trial was futile and the European Medicines Agency released them from the regulatory commitment. The investigators did not agree with that and pressed to continue with the trial, and some limited funding was made available to do that, which was insufficient to really go for as long or as many people as we would have liked, and we were forced to stop because of reduced funding. Um, and so I think we, we should have put more people in and it should have been longer. But nevertheless, I think you can exclude a, a, a more than a 21% increase in mortality, which you could argue is the ultimate endpoint. Um, and the intention, the on-treatment intention to, to treat didn't meet non-inferiority. So, I, you know, you can only say they weren't different. The intention to treat, which you could argue is a reasonable endpoint for a pragmatic trial, you can exclude a 33% increase in cardiovascular disease. But it is a, it is a good question, and uh, that is one of the weaknesses of the trial. And you make your own judgment about what happened and why. I wonder uh, if, if Dr. Armstrong would want to comment on that and what, how he would view it. Dr. Armstrong. The, the request, you want me to comment on what aspect of the trial? The margin, the margin here was what percent? 40%. 20? 40%. 40. That's a very broad non-inferiority margin. Right. At the beginning of this trial, we started with 1.3, but because of the very low event rate and because of the reduced funding, the committee changed it to 1.4. That's better than some data sa safety data. is better than no safety data. Nevertheless, there isn't a hint of a signal in any of these Kaplan-Meier plots of any significant increased risk. So as a regulator, I would con personally consider this as showing that these 
medicines aren't particularly different. Okay. Um, yes. And would you discuss the um, side effects again, especially as they uh, compare to diclofenac, which has side effects, uh, the desirability of giving these drugs, and how would you uh, choose patients for taking celecoxib over conventional NSAIDs? So um, in Europe, diclofenac used to be the major drug uh, that was used, and the reason for that is it's very effective, and that people take it and they don't go back to their doctors, so they stay on it a long time. Um, it underwent a, a review by the European Medicines Agency, as you know, and they've suggested that it has a higher than cardiovascular risk. But uh, this, remember this trial started something like eight or nine years ago. So these were the drugs that were taking at randomization then. Um, and these are the point estimates, and you can see that you know, NSAIDs are point estimate is slightly worse with diclofenac. I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm referring to side effects, the uh, tolerability of the drugs by patients. You mean are you, are you, uh, this slide? Okay. What would be your patient recommendation based on the patient experience of, of these, these drugs? Some are more, some I, patients like to take, take one as, uh, over the other. Um, so what would you recommend? So the key is that do you get benefit from the drug? That's the key. Because if you don't get benefit, you shouldn't take any drug long term. But if you get benefit, I, my impression of these data are that virtually all the NSAIDs are acceptably safe. In that, I mean, because the event rates are so low, the attributable event rates cannot be high, like versus placebo. I mean, who can take placebo with chronic arthritis anyway? So I think they're acceptably low. They're lower than you'd expect in a population like this. So I, I think that... Nobody's going to do this trial again. These are the data. You're not going to get any more data because there's such low event rates that it's just not going to be done. So I think that if you get benefit, the risk, cardiovascular risks are set to be low, and the GI risks are vanishingly rare. Um, lots of people take ulcer healing drugs now, and I think that perhaps that's part of the reason. Dr. McDonald, thank you very much. We're